We here at Shush acknowledge that we are on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe. The Puyallup people have lived on and stewarded these lands since the beginning of time and continue to do so today. We recognize that this land acknowledgement is one small step toward true allyship, and we commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, and histories of the indigenous people of this land and beyond. Welcome to the Puyallup Public Library's podcast, Shush with Debbie, where we interview and connect with people of the library, city, Puyallup businesses, and the community. I am Debbie. I work here at the library as outreach technician, where I mostly do outreach, but I really do a little bit of everything. I am super excited to welcome our fabulous guest, our systems and information technology librarian, Paul Stonebridge. Welcome, Paul. Hello, Debbie. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I am thrilled that you are here. All righty. So I'm going to ask a couple questions that I ask all of our guests. And the first one is, tell our listeners who you are and a little about yourself. Well, as you said, my name is Paul, and I am the Systems and Information Technology Librarian here. Basically, I take care of all of our IT-related problems, our maintain our computers, our internet, our public printing, some of that fun stuff when you come in and get on our free Wi-Fi and you're trying to print 10 pages from your cell phone. Uh, I'm the guy that's uh, keeping track of that and kind of keeping it online, doing our kiosk for self-checkout, kind of keeping all of our front-facing technology working, uh, yes. as well as all the stuff in the back that the staff uses. So it's a big thing to kind of keep it all online because it's a big building and we have a lot of staff here and exactly. a lot of computers. We have a lot of computers and a lot of technology. Exactly. But that's what libraries are about. So exactly. we want people to come in and use it, and we're always trying to upgrade it. So to keep it kind of mm-hmm. on the cutting edge, it takes a little bit of uh, time and effort. Like those lockers, holds lockers we just installed. Yes, it's one of our big new projects. Mm-hmm. We just installed public pickup lockers, 24-7, 365 lockers on the outside of the building. You can use your library card, scan yep. it to pick up a book that you pre-requested, and we placed in there for you. Three in the morning, you're coming home uh, from downtown party time, and you uh, decided you need to get that book. We've got you covered. That's right. They need their books. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Number two, tell me about your connection to Puyallup and the Puyallup Library. Well, I live in Puyallup. I'm actually a resident in South Hills. Mm -hmm. It's kind of my home area. Very cool. This is a great place to work. I'm just down the street. I like to be able to say that I'm helping the community I live in and that I'm so working true. for the people that are surrounding us here. So mm-hmm. I get to know a lot of people. It's great. I have that sense of connection. You know, I go to some of the businesses. I see people that are at the library. I go to the mall and I'll see a kid that comes into the library regularly. So I, I kind of have that uh, hometown connection I feel with it rather than someone who's commuting long distance to go to work. So it's very nice to say that you're part of the place that you live and contributing directly. That is so important, I feel. It makes a huge difference, don't you feel? It does. It, it, people just feel more like you understand what they're mm-hmm. going through, what they're about, what they need, and it makes it a little bit easier to deliver that level of service. Exactly. It's the perspective that you have mm-hmm. being among the people exactly. that you serve. So uh, where did you grow up? I am the quintessential military brat, so ah. I'm all over the place. I was born in Colorado. Mm. I lived in New York. I have lived in Virginia. I lived in Nebraska. I lived wow. in Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> and Florida for a long time. Yes. Uh, and then out here to Washington, and I've been here for many years. So I was all over the place, a little bit of the whole spectrum of uh, the U.S., really, kind of center and the northeast and the south and the east coast and the west coast. So yeah. I've done a little bit of everything. I don't really have a particular place I grew up. I've got sort of a, I don't know, an amalgam of everything. Yeah. A little bit of the best of all the worlds, I hope. That's so cool. That seems appropriate for you. It, it does explain it. It also says why people tell me I have no accent whatsoever. Exactly. They can't identify one at all. Ah. And everyone says, I, I just can't pick it out because I picked up a little bit of... <laughs> A little bit here and there. Exactly, exactly. That's awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, Are you still friends? This is your second question. Are you still friends with anyone from elementary school, high school, college? Uh, Being that military kid, it was tough for elementary school and, you know, pre-internet. Yeah. I'm not Gen Z or anything, so Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't connected online with everyone, so I lost track of a lot of the uh, elementary Mm -hmm. school. 
people, though I, I know a couple of them are out and about. Mm-hmm. There. But middle and high school, I do have a couple that are around. You know, oh, that's cool. They live in Florida now because that's where I went to those. Uh huh. And you know, uh, more of the people that I know now are people I picked up on travel. Oh, uh, things. I have a lot of friends all over the place that are doing trips, doing tours, going yes. around uh, the world, and I've just realized these people. Hey, you live only twenty minutes away from me. So one of the guys that's my one of my top friends here, my best friends in Washington, is. Just up in uh, Bellevue. Yeah, and yeah. I ran into him in Thailand, of all places. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I happen to live in Washington. I said, what? what? And he's about 45 minutes northeast of me. So it's That's just, so cool. I met him years ago, and so we, yeah. know, we, we hang out to this day. So that's yeah. more of my friends are the <clears throat> in the more recent sense. Although, you know, a couple of those high school friends have hung around. And yeah. I think they say count yourself lucky if uh, yeah. you keep uh, anyone from high school. I agree. And later adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Your third question is, was there a teacher who had a particularly strong influence in your life? Tell us about them. Yeah. One of my favorite professors of all time and one of uh-huh. the neatest guys I've ever met was a guy named Roy Van Nest, a medievalist at the University <gasps> of South Florida. A medievalist. He was. He Just was say that again, medievalist. Medievalist, yes. Yes. He was, he was the medieval history professor at the University of South Florida, and one of my degrees is in medieval history. Mm-hmm. So I took... Many of his classes. He was the one and only guy at the time that did that. He taught Viking history as well. Oh, my gosh. A lot of European history. And he was a very interesting fellow. He was very anti-establishment. He was Mm -hmm. an unusual guy. had this little cramped office in a a far-flung building. And Mm -hmm. uh, he used to take a big stamp of anything that the school sent him and just stamp uh, some commentary on every paper they sent him that he would uh, A a negative? Something, well, not quite negative, but just Uh some sort of flippant response he had a whole collection i'm of trying stamps. to think of what would be a you good know. stamp <laughs> well some of, some of them are not say, appropriate for broadcast, but <laughs> you know some of them would be just like go away uh, you know and it was but it was Perfect. a huge you know 72 yes. point font and he'd stamp it all over the paper that's uh, hilarious he knew everything about everything he'd read thousands of books he could uh, talk for hours and uh-huh had a bizarre wry sense of yes humor one of his for example viking history classes he arranged to have four guys in full costume just storm into the room and carry him off in the middle of class. <laughs> no warning for any of the rest of us. And I love this guy. They just ran out of the room, carried him away, and uh, ran down the street a little bit. And we we're all sitting there going, what the heck? <laughs> what is and then, happening? Then he came back and just kind of dusted himself off like nothing had happened and went back to talking. And he paid those guys? Uh, no, they were just students Oh, just his, students of his. Students but he had his, the so. costumes, I bet. Exactly. Oh, they had, well, they had them, I think. They yeah. All, just everyone loved him. Oh, they, they were just, yeah. You know, all, so he'd get all the reenactors and all of the people that were just into his stuff. Oh, my gosh. Stuff. And he was just so popular uh, yeah. a guy that I think everyone wanted to do something. Oh, my gosh. I, I wish he was still teaching, is he? Oh, no. He's a long 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 retired okay uh, gotcha i'll be still with us because i've lost track of him over the years yeah let's look him up because i'd love to see his picture and read about him exactly he He sounds like you honestly he sounds exactly (laughs) like you i think i picked up some of him and he was one of the very first professors when university of south florida opened so yeah that gives you some idea how long he was there whoa yeah Yeah. what a find you were meant to be his oh yeah i was uh, serendipity (laughs) right there for sure (laughs) i love it Okay, here's an interesting question. Your number four that you chose. If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, see, it's so hard to pick a, a meal. It but, is. But, you know, the the type of thing that you can just eat repeatedly over and over again for me is yes. something very simple. Pasta. Ah, uh, pasta. Spaghetti of some kind. But yes. I like uh, the aglio e olio, the <laughs> butter and olive oil. Say that again. Aglio e olio. If oh, I'm my that word. Right. I don't okay. Know if I am ever, but I mm-hmm. try to trust my yes. pseudo Italian. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that pasta is so versatile. You put butter, you put olive oil, mm. you can mix garlic, you can mix any vegetables you mm. want, uh, any meat technically, although chicken and pork and things work better. Mm. It's one of those, it's so widespread, so varied, and you can just enjoy it so much that you don't ever get sick of it. Yeah. Anytime I was in, you know, when I was in college, when I had a little bit more money, I would uh, buy some of that. Yeah. Make it a huge bowl and live off of it for a week. Yeah, and then then add different ingredients. Yeah. Exactly. Throw in whatever I could find, whatever frozen vegetables (laughs) I could scrounge up, you know, and so it became kind of entrenched in my diet there. And I still do it to this day. It's comfort food, I guess, now. Yeah. Comfort food is good. What is the? It's a noodle. So what does it look like? It's because it's the uh, olive oil and butter. It's just kind of almost clear. You know, it's uh-huh. a real. You see the noodles basically. Yeah. The, the color of the vegetables, the color of the ingredients that you add to it, whether you put olives in there, or mixture. 
is f first and foremost rather than yeah. the sauce taking over the color. Gotcha. So it becomes uh, all about the uh, side ingredients in it, and the pasta is kind of a delivery. Yeah. So I'm, I have a real, I don't know, love of this kind of idea of the imparting, or imparting flavor to things yes. by uh, the virtue of all the mixture that you put in there. Yeah, changing it up. Exactly. Oh, that sounds excellent. Okay, so that was number four. Number five is, if you didn't have your current career, I would be sad. Uh, what occupation would you like to try? Well, I've tried one. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, and I, I, yes. I might go back to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been a tour guide for many years, mm -hmm. uh, often as a side gig, and then I did it full-time for a while, and we're talking international tours, so oh. I did overseas state tours uh, in Southeast Asia, Japan, yep. and Western Europe. I wouldn't mind going back to that, but if I couldn't do one I've already done before, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I really enjoy is diving. So I would dive. You're would, a diver. I am. I, I my, did. That's something I didn't know about oh, you. Yeah, it is. I have my. Wow, you have all the gear. I, yes, some still. I haven't had yeah. a lot of cause to use it here, and you need different gear in Washington. Oh, okay, gotcha. But you know, I still will occasionally go out on it. Like in March, wow. I'm going to Australia to dive the Great Barrier Reef. Oh. So I'm, you know, hoping I would love to be a dive master and do that wow. full time. If I had to, one of those, I could do anything I want. Money yeah. Not an object. Kind of. Yeah. I think I'd love to go into you know the South Pacific somewhere and do that gig or Hawaii. You mean taking people to teaching like, them to dive, taking them on a dive gotcha. trip, showing them around. You know, we, we kind of combine the travel thing but if i have to pick a new career that's right. something else i enjoy oh. take people out to see the wrecks like wow in australia we're going to go out and see some wrecks in uh, off the coast of brisbane we're going to go to the oh. great barrier reef and see some of the wildlife and some of the hope wow. still unspoiled areas there wow well, you got to get out there soon yeah because it. it's not going to be long the bleaching is happening and mm. there and so you know mm -hmm. i'd love to show people that kind of stuff and say yeah. oh, here's a whole new world yeah if you will the yeah little disney phrase yeah it's, but it's true it is its own world. For sure. And so, that, I, I don't know. I think that that idea of that foreign environment, that mm -hmm. you're kind of, you're the visitor in mm -hmm. the truest sense of the word is really a, yep. a cool experience for people, especially once they've done it a couple of times and they get comfortable enough to actually look around. Yeah, exactly. Because there would be so much to learn before you got to that point. For sure. I feel like that would be. You do. You yeah. spend your first several dives just kind of worrying more about your gear and what yeah. you're doing than about what's around you. But yeah. yeah. Everyone's a little different. But, you know, after three, two, three, four, five, you get yeah. pretty comfortable and you're, yeah. you're like, okay, I, yeah. can, I can actually look at this fish now and yeah. I'm okay. I feel good. Did you ever dive without all the gear, you know, just do like, you know, the pearl divers? A little bit. I, yeah. I, not so much free diving, but I've yeah. done you know, just the tank and the snorkel and the, yeah. the regulator strapped onto me and no, yeah. no other gear in yeah. Florida, especially where it was nice and warm. Right. And there are a lot of uh, shark tooth fossil beds off the coast of Sarasota oh. there that are great for uh, shallow diving. They're like 16, oh, 17 fine. feet. Yeah. And every time there's a major storm, there's fossil beds that sort of flip over. Oh, that's cool. And you can go out there and find a whole bevy of new fossils, manatee bones. Oh, that's right. You're Because you're into Sharky. fossils. I am. I yeah, do. that's another one of your I, interests. I love fossils. Of and, the millions. And, and, well, you know, hey, varied interests keep things exciting. That's but, right. And there, you can pick them up yourself. You can go grab a megalodon so tooth cool. and just find it right there on the oh my gosh. seabed and take it home with you. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's move on to, let's see, that was uh, number five. Oh, okay, so six is right here next to it. <laughs> uh, what is the most important lesson you've learned over your career? Well, this one's a little more serious, a little more dark, mm -hmm. but, you know, working in libraries for so long, mm -hmm. a lot of what we do is akin to social work. We're mm -hmm. trying to help people. So true. And we people come in with great needs, sometimes mm -hmm. in great trouble, and we're the last place they're turning or they don't know who to turn to. Exactly. And Sometimes you can help people and sometimes you can't. That's the, true. Uh, the one, I guess the biggest lesson is that you just can't save everybody. That's and true. You have to really just accept that because no matter how hard you try, sometimes people come to you for help, but they're not really at the point where they really want it. True. Yet. And you can give them all the resources in yes. the world, but unless they're willing to reach out and grab them themselves, yep. they're not, they're not going to get anywhere. And I, it's sad watching that happen. And it you, is. You, but you realize, man, there's so many people that need it. How do I pick and choose? And mm -hmm. while there's no good answer to it, sometimes you just have to say, I, I have to try to help the next yes. person and do what I can. So it's, yes. that's, I guess, the biggest lesson and the, the hardest lesson. <laughs> it <laughs> is kind of a hard lesson. Sometimes it's true. You have to pick. Yeah, you just have to realize you cannot save all the people. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really a, an important thing to realize and deal with because 
there are so many, like you said, and that so, need help. And sometimes if you spend too much time in one, you miss out yes. on where you could be helping and another, another where yeah. you could be more effective or more, mm-hmm. maybe you're the person they really need. And then yeah. hopefully, maybe you'll set the stage for that other person, but they're right. not ready yet. And yeah. uh, someone else will be the one that helps them. Yeah, true. Well, that, that was beautifully said. Okay, we're on our last question that you chose. This is a biggie. What is your earliest memory? Oh, well, see, that's, this is one goes back to food again. I don't know. So many of my memories are food-related. You're a foodie. I, I am. Yeah. And when we lived in uh, New York, I was very young, and we lived in upstate New York mm-hmm. in Syracuse, and my parents had a very large piece of land mm-hmm. there just out in the boonies. And wow. huge patch of uh, blackberries on the <gasps> uh-huh. property and uh, raspberries and other things yeah. all mixed together yeah. uh, there. And that's one of my earliest, when my brain came online, memories uh. is – going out there and them taking me out to just eat them off of the vine oh. uh, right off of the plant itself and eating them fresh and just so i have memories of just grabbing whole handfuls of them and putting them uh, into my mouth as a little kid you yeah know, they're just to me they seemed enormous right right that and these huge plant towering over oh. there's probably nothing more yeah like a few feet tall but but to you from my memory mm-hmm. is maybe two two and a half years yeah. old i'm going these are enormous and i'm eating this fruit and i just kept eating fruit until yes. i couldn't uh, eat fruit anymore <laughs> that's adorable <laughs> you know another thing it makes me think of is one time when our family was all together and camping and out back of the house we were renting it was in the san juans where these blackberry mm. f- like like f- not a field but a huge yard full you know they went all across and we all you know did the same thing you did um but they were warm from the sun Yes. And there's a difference to eating berries on the vine that are warm by the sun and just being plucked and popped in your mouth. And fully, fully ripe. Yes. Not, not picked four days early. Exactly. And ripe, and yes. Yeah. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. One of those great pleasures in life that people yes. don't, you haven't really lived till you've experienced something like that. I agree. Whether it's a berry or a peach or a strawberry, yes. you know, something like that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Paul. So now we're to the uh, segment of the interview where we ask the last couple questions that we ask every guest. And number three, you'll have some info on this one. What book or books or film or films would you like to recommend and why? Wow, there's a, a lot. I read. I look at a lot of stuff, a yes. wide array of things, and I read a lot of history and a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, so I read a recent book on the new kind of a new uh, take on the history of central europe oh uh, to pull out the title but it's okay. it was a book about uh the, all of the things in central europe and what brought everything together what brought uh all of the kind of modern laws and the societal divisions and wow the, uh, country divisions that we have all together in one spot one kind of new take on this uh history here and yeah I'll bring up that title for okay you because, uh that's why I'm great, I'm terrible with names, so it's always so. Oh, the Middle Kingdoms: A New History of Central oh, Europe. Oh, the Middle uh, Kingdom. Martin Rady. Uh, okay. R A D Y. He's uh, pretty good. He's uh, mm-hmm. very I don't know succinct historian mm-hmm. and kind mm-hmm. of a, uh, it was a very I don't know quick read for a history book. Uh, right. You have to like history, but I I enjoyed it and I got a lot of new insight that I hadn't. Interesting. Had so that was pretty cool to see a focus more on. Uh, the kingdoms, the, the kingdoms, quote unquote, in the center right. of Europe, as opposed to yeah. focus more on England and France and Spain than so many other right. histories do. Uh, and I would bring up, uh, oh, maybe another uh, brand, brand new one: uh, the Japanese, a history in uh, twenty lives. So it, it takes the uh, perspective of twenty different people's lives mm-hmm. and kind of tries to convey. Japanese history through the lens of those people's existences. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a pretty Oh, that cool sounds like up. another wonderful one. Yeah, it's that sort of vignette thing. You get a little bit of a glimpse into everyone, and it makes the point of a broader right. uh, historical perspective. Do you have the author on that one? Oh, that one, I, I do. I actually brought a list, luckily, in case okay. of this kind of question. Uh, and that's Christopher Harding. Okay. That literally just came out December 12th, I think. Okay, uh, perfect. So that's a brand new uh, okay. one out there, but you can find it online everywhere. A really neat looking cover with the kind of different cards, almost, of people's faces on it. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay, those sound great. Any films? Oh, what have I seen? I haven't seen a whole lot recently. Okay. Um, uh, you know, hey, I have to say it. I, I was one of those people that was skeptical of the Barbie movie at first and loved that one oh, over the summer. Oh, you were skeptical, but yet loved I, it. I, I loved the heck out of that one. And I, you yes, know, I, I me have to too. Say, I thought it was so much more well done and you know, mm-hmm. campy and upbeat and fun uh, mm-hmm. than 
but yet exactly. had a message. And I, and I hadn't seen a movie in theaters in quite some time. Uh -huh. so to kind of have that be my return to theaters yes. was pretty good. That's um, good. And I, You I, laugh, I, you cry. And, and one other one that was really great recently was uh, Miyazaki, uh, Hayao Miyazaki, the Japanese I'm filmmaker. curious about that one. The Boy and the Heron. I, mm -hmm. went and I did actually see that one mm -hmm. in theaters. Uh, and strange, strange piece. Mm -hmm. uh, visually stunning, probably Ooh. the most visually pleasing of any of it was he's done. Really? And I heard the highest budget of any uh, movie he's uh. done, maybe even any Japanese movie in general, so that ex does explain Yeah, it, it does. Though the storyline is Alice in Wonderland and beyond in a way. It's just so oh, wow. strange and disjointed yeah. and uh, whimsical and uh, mm. just, uh, psychedelic in some ways. Wow. Uh, and it, if you like that sort of disjointed storytelling with uh, bizarre visuals, it's right. the way to go. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, let's see. There's a couple things I want to just touch on before I let you go. Number one, today you took down the uh, display case. Could you just describe it to the listeners? Because that display case was like no other. Oh, well, yeah, that was a fun display. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do uh, medieval weapons and armor. Mm -hmm. uh, Are you a medievalist? I am. I am at yes. heart a medievalist. And I've <laughs> taken to making, over the years, taken to making chain and leather yes. uh, armor pieces. Chain mail. And, uh, yeah, chain mail and uh, various other jewelry pieces mm -hmm. and uh, decorative pieces, you know, armor pieces, uh, some with a realistic kind of history and some a little more whimsical and fantastic. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not a, a purist on either end. You mm -hmm. know, I'll go with whatever uh, just strikes my fancy. Mm -hmm. I, so I set up a display of those with some of the, uh, some cool weapons to show, although I don't make the weapons myself, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the jewelry and just some of the more interesting whimsical objects like bottle covers and mm -hmm. things. And uh, I don't know, I think it made for uh, something a little bit different that the library hasn't showcased Exactly. Before. And uh, we had a really... <laughs> It was really nice, too, because we had a nutcracker display right next to it. So yes. I thought it was really fun to it have was balanced. colorful nutcrackers and yes. dozens and dozens of them right next yeah. to uh, all these weapons and armor that were kind of dark <laughs> medieval and stuff. medieval and kind of <laughs> brutalist in nature, and yes. uh, but still fun and educational. And we ended up having a lot of families and kids asking about it. Yes. So I, it I think made it, me so happy. Yeah, I, I think we ended mm -hmm. up checking out. <laughs> More books in the Middle Ages than I, we have in a month. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's what it's all about. <laughs> Teaching and learning. I yes. love it. Yeah. Well, your stuff is beautiful, and I'll add to, just as a side note, that on Halloween, Paul wore his full costume armor, which had chainmail underneath and leather stuff and pieces all handmade by him, down gauntlets, up and down, legs, arms, uh, helmet, you name it. So... It's pretty dang impressive. It was fun, I'll tell you. It was about yeah. 50 pounds worth of gear. I would walk around <laughs> with it at work all day, but it was worth it. It was, it was worth, worth it. it. We had a lot of uh, yeah. people think it was really fun, and yep. the kids were just kind of <gasps> Yes, <all day. laughs> exactly. So cool. The other one I want to mention, the other thing about you here at the library is your travel talks that you've been giving have been super well attended, and people are just loving them. I'm so I'm yeah, thrilled. And, and yeah. That's, I just started those in October. Uh, they're, they often are themed. I do a different mm -hmm. country or area every mm -hmm. month. Uh, talk about the culture, the people, the food, mm -hmm. the history, the sights and sounds. Uh, try to always provide food from that country directly. Yes, you do. I, I track down the, the beauty of living in the Seattle and Puget Sound mm -hmm. area is that there's always a market of specialty food origin everywhere. Yes. I can find just a little bit of everything if I ask around and look yep. deep enough and, of course, help out a local small business. Yeah. Bring in that food. Let everyone taste the food from yep. the country. Give a real experience to mm -hmm. it. And then hopefully educate people. And honestly, we've had a huge increase in the number of oh. people. We had almost 50 people show up at the we last We did. One. It was fantastic. And, and that was great. It was a fun time. We talked about German Christmas mm -hmm. markets. Debbie here played some music. Oh, she's it was fun. Guru, <laughs> and uh, entertained everyone with German Christmas songs and others. And I think it kind of brings that sort of cultural cohesiveness to the library. It does. It teaches people about other uh, cultures and societies and yes. brings an appreciation to it when you can do it in a fun kind of engaging manner. And exactly. We've even had some kids and uh, teens coming, yep. which is the biggest thing uh, there. I love to see it. I, I love, love to, to see that, too. Experience a new uh, mm -hmm. people, a new uh, society, and right. walk away going, oh, my God, I learned Yes. This. When can we go to Germany exactly. or whatever? And yeah. We've got a couple coming up. I don't know when this will be uh, posted, but we've got Iceland in January. Mm -hmm. We've got Central and South America in February. Fantastic. We're going to be talking about Egypt in March. <gasps> And, really? Uh, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia in April. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so oh, my goodness. And you've been to all these places, so you bring all you bring some uh, some keepsakes that you have from each of the cultures 
uh, besides the food. Right. I and pictures. Pictures. I bring stuff. Exactly, yeah, exactly. stories. Mm-hmm. I try to only go to places or talk about places I've been. Yeah. And 90% of the pictures are my own. Yeah. Uh, generally, I only add if I just really need to display some specific thing that I didn't ever get a yeah. picture of. And I try to tell people that. But it's uh, I'm trying to share it from my own experience. So yeah. It's a little more real, a little more mm-hmm. personal in there and then not so clinical when I'm yeah, talking about it. I'm exactly. To keep it fun and keep it uh, more of a personal experience that these uh, that the listeners would actually have if they went to that place. Exactly. It's wonderful. So with that, I'll wrap things up here. Paul, I'm so glad to have you here on Shush. I'm so glad to have you working in the library. You have changed my life with helping me with the podcast, as well as my husband, Paul, helping me with the podcast and everything you do here. I, I go to you daily for questions and help, and uh, it's it's a better place having you here, and I just appreciate all your talents and skills and how professional and fun and funny you are. Well, thank you, Debbie, and I'm, that's that's high praise coming from you, and I would love to think that I can stay for a long time and Me hopefully too. bring a little bit of this back to the people going forward. And, hey, if you want to come and see any of my programs, you're always welcome to come out to the library, or if you want to just chat about medieval history or armor or something random, I'm, I'm almost yep. always at the desk at least three, four hours a day. Yep, at both desks, both reference desks. and circ. Upstairs and downstairs, yeah, find upstairs, me. Upstairs, downstairs. Just look for the guy with the long hair and the beard. He can't miss him. Yes, me. you can't <laughs> miss him. He's a medievalist, remember? Okay. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Debbie, for okay. having me. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.